the recording. Okay, hi, hi. Uh, after a, a quite a long uh, break, we're gonna have uh, our conspiracy talk um, in English. Uh, last time we had a really uh, interesting conversation in Polish, but it was about um, conservat conservative esoterism and, and occultism with Professor Wilomski, uh, a Polish um, a political scientist. So it's very, very interesting. Maybe we're gonna translate it because he wrote a very interesting book about uh, conservative, uh, conservative European um, um, ideologies uh, regarding um, occultism. But uh, anyway, uh, this is this is the the last conspiracy talk that we had in Polish. But uh, uh, in the new year, we uh, we have a very uh, my 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 very, my very good friend uh, Cameron McGregor, and um, uh, so uh, hello in the new year. Cameron. Happy Happy New Year and uh, Jean Dobre to uh, to your audience. Thank you. So uh, Cameron is uh, uh, was already in my one of my conspiracy talk, but this was uh, audio, so it's uh, the first time that we see each other and others gonna see us on YouTube and and, and on Twitter. Uh, well, ex former Twitter. And uh, so uh, I like to ask you um, because we have thirty minutes, Cameron. Uh, your insight, what is happening now in a political and social sphere or culture? Uh, your your uh, what do you see in the United States, or how this year it's starting in the United States, and what what are the cru crucial issues uh, that we Europeans and Eastern Europeans or Central Europeans can uh, you know be more f familiar, uh, not to only watch what is happening with, with, through media. Could you could you give us like points that are uh, the most uh, you think is going to be the most important uh, this year in? Uh, in political sphere, social and culture in in the United States. Sure, and uh, thanks for thanks for having me on, Michal. It's always good to talk to you, and I, I wish your audience all the best. I, I would say now is a very interesting time uh, to be sure. The United States at the moment is uh, very unstable. Now, at the same time, I would say that there's. Uh, a very profound gap or a big divergence between the elites or you might say the upper third on the socioeconomic ladder and the rest of the population. The view from Wall Street, the view from Washington, D.C., the view from uh, presumably Los Angeles and other major metropolitan cities or across the country is that the the economy is stable and recovering, that the financial system is robust and strong. And that whatever problems that we have, whether it's the southern border or it's uh, rising poverty in certain areas of the country uh, and manifested in terms of layoffs or it's uh, rising prices in the form of inflation, that those problems are more or less abating. In other words, that the government has control and uh, that 2024 should be a fairly strong year economically. That being said, their view is that the political sphere is extremely contentious, and, and no doubt they're right about that. And so their focus principally is on keeping the status quo intact, uh, maintaining the Biden presidency to whatever degree that they can, and corralling Trump and his, and his supporters. Now, whether or not that happens is another matter. The view from Main Street or from middle America or folks that are outside of the uh, upper echelon in terms of socioeconomic power is that the country is crumbling, that we're slowly being overwhelmed with mass immigration, illegal immigration coming up from Mexico, lawlessness in the inner cities, um, the growth of structural unemployment, especially as it pertains to Americans that are under the age of 40, so millennials, as we call them, who can't buy homes. Uh, they're moving back back in with their parents. They barely have enough money to uh, pay for groceries. So there, there's a, a conflict emerging between these two fundamental realities or bubbles, if you will. And my suspicion is that uh, the tenuous situation in the United States economically, politically, and socially is going to crash into the elite corridors. I think a very similar dynamic is... is uh, the case in Europe as well, the, the gap between the elites and the rest of the population. The difference in Europe, of course, is that I think the economy is, is not nearly as strong, or at least the perception is it's not nearly as strong as it is in the United States. So um, this conflict is probably going to manifest in, in a very tumultuous election cycle that has already begun. 
Um, the thinking in D.C., I suppose, is that these various criminal cases, civil suits against Donald Trump will prevent him from mounting a legitimate campaign for the White House. I, I don't know how it's going to go, but my sense is that the convergence of crises happening, not just domestically in the United States, but geopolitically, you know, the war in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, this uh, escalating conflict in the Middle East, my sense is that that is going to cascade into a very serious geopolitical crisis that's going to rock the world. And I think America will face a very disruptive election cycle as a result. It's possible that you get a disruption that goes all the way to the, the level of, pre of the presidency, meaning that the Biden administration may not last until November. Um, I've been on of the mindset that it's it's very possible that an acute banking crisis or economic crisis or geopolitical crisis could ruin the administration well before we get to the November elections. That being said, um, it's anybody's bet. Mm -hmm. So how this um, social situation that you uh, explain us uh, going to uh, influence the political landscape in the United States uh, in the elections? Uh, so... Um, uh, and the second question would be uh, because you, you you already answered a bit about this. Uh, how do you see the chances to throw out Trump uh, uh, from the election uh, race? So how how is gonna so how how do you think and how the polls and uh, maybe your view uh, is gonna sh shape the landscape? And uh, is Trump is really a possibility to sh throw him out from the uh, from the elections? Yeah. So, you know, this is going to be a test, if you will, of the last gasp of American democracy. If you go back to 2016, the assumption was that Donald Trump was such a a a polarizing figure, such an outside political voice that he had no chance of winning the presidency. And of course, as we know, he did. And when he did, it shocked the elites. It shocked the, the government uh, completely. And so what that precipitated was a four-year standoff between Trump and his very uh, small band of supporters in uh, his administration and virtually the entire political apparatus arrayed against him. And uh, more or less, I would say that the political establishment won. They pushed him out of office and they stymied his entire agenda. That being said, Trump remained extremely popular and continues to be so. And the country, at least, of, I, I think, according to the polls, is headed in the, in the wrong direction. So it's going to be a test of the will of the American people, which demands reform and some degree of accountability, and the entire political establishment. So not just the government, but academia, the nonprofits, uh, the media industrial complex, Hollywood, you know, all of the elite corridors arrayed against Donald Trump. I don't think he can prevail. I don't think that he can overcome those forces, in part because his own party, the Republican Party, is part of the establishment. They don't want Donald Trump elected any more than the establishment does on the left. So I, I think it's going to be too difficult for him to overcome. That being said, if you get these shocks to the system, if you get a major economic crisis and a banking crisis, which I fully expect to continue this year, anything becomes possible. So it's anybody's bet, uh, Mikhail, but it is going to test whether or not American democracy survives. My guess is I don't think it will. I, I think that democracy is more or less going to crumble this year, at least in the minds of the American people. For those of us that have paid attention, American democracy has been subverted for the better part of 30 years, maybe longer. But I think growing in the, the public mind, there is the, the sense that this is the last gasp of uh, Trumpian reform. That's probably true. And so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot of confidence that he's going to be elected. I think he will be stopped by the establishment. Uh, I think some, some time ago we met in Prague and we had some um, discussions about uh, Trump uh, because uh, you are not a kind of mainstream, uh, we can say, uh, a Republican or, or a right-wing uh, mainstream uh, thinker uh, in the United States. Um, so could you uh, give your explanation from uh, your point of view and point of view of the so-called alt-right uh, or anti-globalistic uh, right in United States on Trump, 
because of course Trump uh, seems like a outsider, uh, uh, anti-establishment and so on. But in the wider perspective, kind of um, counter-revolutionary perspective or anti-globalistic perspective, maybe um, he's he seems as a kind of a right wing of the of the, of the mainstream. But uh, of course, the the right wing of the right wing, of, but it, it, from the mainstream. So uh, how do you how do you uh, after the uh, the first um, you know th that uh, does uh, Trump change from the first uh, um, uh, um, presidency or? Or is gonna be if 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 he would won if it would be the copy paste from uh, what he did uh, from, on this his first term? Yeah, no, it's it's a very good question. Um, my sense is that Donald Trump is exactly as you say. He is more or less a slightly right wing version of uh, a mainstream Republican candidate, um, and as such, he represents to some degree a continuation of the status quo. Uh, the idea that we can elect our way out of the problems that, that we face. Now, whether or not we can is another matter, but um, what's happening, as you alluded to, is that there is a very real conflict, not just in the United States, not just in the West, but around the world between globalism and civilization. Civilization manifests itself, uh, manifests in terms of um, national identity, national consciousness um, rooted in history, in shared culture, common identity, you know, traditional values, uh, Christianity, so forth and so on. Globalism seeks to undermine and destroy those forces. So that's the, the real conflict at stake. And unfortunately, within that broader conflict, uh, Trump is not a big player. You know, he, he's sort of operating at the margins of that. And so he's inspiring hope that somehow we can carry on with the status quo. But as I said, I, I don't think that that's the way that this is going to go. We face a broader existential crisis in the West and especially in the United States that demands root and branch reform. Uh, that is not what Trump represents. Trump represents at most incremental reform. The public at some point is going to wake up to that, but I, I suspect they're not going to wake up until there's a broader crisis that forces them to do so. Will that happen this year? I, I think it's very likely that it will. In fact, uh, you could argue that that existential crisis has already begun. It began when the Russians went into Ukraine and we immediately began to escalate uh, conflict against them. It began when the Federal Reserve started to raise interest rates and our economy started to gyrate out of control. And we've had a banking crisis and now we have a debt crisis. So I think the, the pillars undermining the, the legacy structure, underpinning the legacy structure are beginning to give. Whether or not we get a shock that's going to shake the tree completely this year or not is very hard to say. But I think it's very likely because of the geopolitical mess unfolding in the Middle East, because of this escalation between left and right in the United States, and because of a very fragile economy. So what we need in the West is what I think is beginning to happen in Europe, and that is the rise of nationalist parties. I call it Masco nationalism. Um, I think it's it's only beginning to gain momentum in the United States. But as such, we need new parties, we need new leaders, and we just haven't crossed that bridge yet because people are hoping that Trump is the reform that's necessary. But as I said, I don't think he is. Mm -hmm. So basically, Trump only sh uh, is shifting more to the right to our uh, positions, the discourse, and maybe some policies. But uh, anyway, he's not the uh, the end goal uh, of the of the of the, our stance, like a right wing uh, conservative. Uh, Anti, anti That's right. And, and even and even if he were, he needs a party. He needs a movement. He needs a political apparatus that would support his vision. No such organization, no such infrastructure exists. I mean, people ask me all the time about the right wing in the United States. And I say, look, there is no organized right wing in the United States. It doesn't exist outside of, you might say, the manosphere or what I call the neo-masculine movement. But th these are very small corners of the Internet in which you have a, a growing number of people that realize that the political process is broken, and that we need new parties, that left and right are an illusion. But the, the majority of the public doesn't understand that yet. And so they're putting all their hopes in the idea that one man um, who makes certain appeals to reform 
can change the system. But I think you and I know, and I, I think a growing number of people, whether they're in Poland or Germany or France or the United States, recognize that the entire system is broken. So Trump's not going to fix it. Mm -hmm. So we see because uh, in many Europeans, uh, right think, thinking the Europeans are looking on Trump, but uh, from your perspective, this is a kind of an illusion that Trump uh, would be the spark uh, for the some uh, um, uh, crucial changes in the in in a global sphere. Uh, of course, the United States have this kind of uh, you know it's it's main uh, still main the state, but uh, you don't think that uh, Trump would be the spark that would change like uh, crucial those uh, uh, structural problems that we have uh, in this globalistic uh, world that we are living in now. No, no, the 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 key, the the crucial permutation will come because of a financial catastrophe, one that will wipe out public debts across the West. Uh, that will crush the welfare state, that will invalidate or delegitimize the legacy structure completely. And I think that's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Or a war that more or less accomplishes the same thing. Um, it, it appears as though one or the other, or presumably both, could happen at the same time. I'm very concerned, increasingly concerned, that we're going to see a regional war or worse in the Middle East. As you know, American forces have been surged to the region to support Israel. And more or less the entire world supports a ceasefire in Gaza, except Israel and the United States. And so that further imperils the United States um, and potentially could put us into a war with other powers that would only expose the underlying fragility of our political structure, our economy, our fiscal situation, and all the, all the rest. So we are facing a very dangerous situation, both overseas and domestically, but it's one, as I said, that the, the elites, that uh, the legacy structure is completely oblivious to. I think the average American is somewhat privy to our economic fragility. They know that we have a serious uh, political crisis in the country, but they too are unaware of the potential the potential for a disastrous war in the Middle East. And so we're steaming right into it, unawares, and no doubt that could catalyze any number of destructive consequences. Either way, that's what it's going to take to wake up these populations to the idea that we need fundamental reform. It's not going to be Trump. It's not going to be some other Western European leader. It's going to require an emergency, a crisis that wakes up the population. Yeah, so it's important that you said about um, the crisis on in uh, um, Western Asia or Middle East in Israel and Gaza and escalation to the Red Sea. Uh, we had uh, that uh, the Yemen forces, the rebel, rebel so-called rebel forces in Yemen uh, shot uh, some United States ships and there were some uh, retaliations uh, from the United States. And uh, so, and this is of course the mm, the uh, uh, the Ormus uh, Ormus Strait and and uh, the Red Sea, with which uh, uh, most of Euro Asian goods are coming from China, from Eastern uh, or to China or or uh, oil and gas um, to uh, Asian countries. So one one of the like uh, um, main Euro Asian routes. Uh, uh, trade routes um, and of course we have a war in Ukraine on the Black Sea so w w another another Euro Asian um, uh, link um, so um, how how it's uh, how it's uh, because I know that you were um, uh, officer of uh, naval forces in the United States and uh, from from your point of view ex your experience uh, in in uh, in um, in uh, naval forces of United States officer, uh, how do you see this problem that all those uh, sea routes uh, can be uh, under the some uh, regional war, and of course they're gonna that those uh, mm, uh, supply chains gonna be uh, you know cut off uh, from Euro Asia, and what is gonna happen then? Yes, yeah, so I I was a surface warfare officer. I served in the U.S. Navy, and I deployed to the Middle East in uh, 2008. So I've actually sailed through the Straits of Hormuz. I've been in every part of the of the Arabian Gulf, and uh, I have been um, in uh, the Gulf of Oman and near the Red Sea. I was actually there when we had issues with Somali piracy. So it's it's a region fraught with with all kinds of turmoil and instability and disruption. And frankly, the world doesn't 
appreciate the extent to which the global economy depends on these supply chains through these trade routes. So I, I would say there's three things going on here. One is there's imperial overstretch for the United States. The U.S. in the 1980s had about 600 naval ships for a global forward presence um, that spanned from Asia all the way to the Mediterranean and North America. So a global presence with about 600 ships. Now, of course, in those days, the, the mission of the U.S. Navy was to preserve um, hemispheric defense and international trade as well as to deter the Soviets. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, more or less, we just left our empire intact, but we shrank our forces. So today we've got maybe 200 operational ships that are performing the same mission. So one issue is we have imperial overstretch and the decline of the U.S. military. So it's, it's not just that our mission is expansive beyond our capability. It's also that our forces have declined for a number of reasons. Part of it is mismanagement. Part of it is wokeism, you know, diversity standards and so forth that have eroded the professionalism of the U.S. military. Some of it is the decline of our of our in industry. We don't have the military industrial capacity that we once did. We can't build the ships that we used to build. So our forces are overstretched. They're poorly trained. And that pr pr that presents a very dangerous situation um, in which the U.S. military is vulnerable in ways that I don't think people realize. That's one issue. The second issue is this atomic bomb in the form of the conflict between Israel and uh, and the Palestinians in Gaza. Many folks in the United States think that this is a fairly local conflict. In other words, it's basically Israel and bordering countries. That's not what's happening. What's happening is you're seeing this galvanizing Islamic consciousness around the region that's mobilizing against Israel. It includes Iran. It includes Turkey. It includes all the neighboring Arab states that are up in arms against a humanitarian catastrophe because of Israeli escalation in Gaza. And remember, they're killing tens of thousands of Arabs. And they're dislocating hundreds of thousands of these people, um, the majority of whom are either starving or they're enfeebled. You know, I, I've heard that cholera has broken out, various other diseases, and humanitarian aid for the most part has been cut off. So that is inflaming the entire region. And then thirdly, you have the, the geopolitical interests of countries like China and India who desperately need energy. They need oil. They need natural gas. And so they could potentially be drawn into this conflict as well. All the while, the United States is completely beholden to Israel. And no one in Washington, D.C., nobody in either party, no major political candidate, presidential candidate, is raising any criticism or mm. concerns or questions about our support for Israel. And so the United States is imperiled. Our interests are potentially compromised and we may be sailing into a regional war on behalf of a power that we're not even formally allied to because nobody in Washington, D.C. opposes the Israel lobby, which uh, dom has dominated our foreign policy for decades. So this is a very dangerous situation that's spring loaded for regional war or potentially worse unless we, uh, the United States, divest. We've got to de-escalate the situation by either withdrawing our forces completely or by calling Netanyahu and his government and demanding that they de-escalate and withdraw from Gaza. But Michal, I don't see that happening. I see further escalation, which means that a global economy that's already fragile, as we know, the Chinese economy has slowed down. I, exactly how bad it is over there, I don't know. At a minimum, they have a, a property uh, crisis. They have a real estate crisis, and we know that uh, their their economy, their GDP numbers have slowed down. Have slowed down. Never mind the supply chain adjustments that have been set in motion since COVID. So, if you add it all up, it's a very combustible mix that threatens to undo the globalist control of the West. The question is, how much more collateral damage will it do in the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have the situation that the tail is waving the dog. Yeah, so the the Israel lobby is um, hijacking the uh, from basically from Reagan uh, or or even before 
the the uh, inter, um, the foreign policy of United States. Yes. Well, so, you uh, there was an there was an interview done. I, I'll send it to you. You should share it with your audience. There was an interview yes. done between Ted Koppel, uh, who who was a, a famous um, news anchor in the United States decades ago, and Richard Nixon. And this interview was held in 1992. And Ted Koppel. Uh, was questioning America's support for Israel. Um, and Richard Nixon admits in the interview that the United States had no strategic interests in supporting Israel, certainly not unilaterally supporting them. And so he said, our, our defense, our unconditional support of, of that country is a, moral, is a moral support. It's born of a special relationship rooted in, in a moral support for the Jewish state. The you, problem, Judeo -Christian, you, you Christian ideology, this kind of Judeo Christian ideology. That and, and, a leg and, a, and a legacy of the Holocaust and so forth. But you know, at some point, once this state engages in what some are calling genocide in Gaza, uh, or at the very least causing a humanitarian disaster that is a, you know, destabilizing an entire region, at what point does that moral support begin to break down? And so my sense is that the special relationship is fast eroding. And remember that most Americans do not understand the extent to which we have given carte blanche, block grants, unlimited military equipment, aid and so forth to Israel. They simply don't understand because everything's been framed in this moral framework. But as I said, if this continues, um, this humanitarian disaster in Gaza and it spreads and begins to destabilize the region, voices will emerge to question what the hell we're doing, especially as it blow, blows back on us, which I expect it to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have like uh, uh, last two or three minutes. So I'd like to have your comment on the World Economic Forum because it's, you know this is three thousand participants, uh, three hundred fifty uh, political um, representation of the states uh, from one hundred twenty five countries, like the organizers are are, are saying. So, uh, did you uh, see uh, saw the uh, WF and uh, did you have any you know opinion? If there's going to happen any any changes in the globalistic uh, elites, uh, you know, uh, ideology or or, or their plans uh, for the this year or the next future? Well, my my sense is, and and look, I there are a lot of folks that are very suspicious of the WEF, and um, I I think assume a certain degree of influence and competency from these supposed global leaders. What I took from what I take from these conferences is it gives you a sense of what they're, what's topical in their mind. And a lot of them have talked about artificial intelligence. A lot of them are talking about climate change and so forth. But what, what I think is important for us is to, to recognize that all the things we just talked about, the, the fiscal crisis that is affecting every Western government from Berlin to Washington, D.C. and London, uh, the economic crisis that is lowering the standards of living for Poles and Germans and Czechs and Frenchmen and Britons and Americans, this uh, this geopolitical nightmare that's unfolding in the Middle East, which could potentially cause a regional war or worse, none of those issues are, are really being considered by the global elite. They don't understand the extent to which they are in a very fragile situation. And that's why I, I think it's very likely that that this situation both overseas and domestically, is going to spiral out of control. So the takeaway is as follows. Uh, they don't appear to realize that they're sitting on a powder keg that could go off at any moment and uh, dethrone them from power. And that's exactly what I think is going to happen. Okay. So uh, the last thing I would like to ask you about your uh, activity in, uh, in uh, online, because you were running a YouTube channel, quite interesting, um, focusing on the... Um, masculinity on neo masculinity the manosphere uh on youtube could um, it's called men uh and the city yes yes, it's yes. precise so uh, please give us our uh, audience so we're gonna we're gonna attach this uh, channel um uh, for the uh, men, um, 
men part of our uh, viewers, but maybe also women, because women also yes. like to have uh, uh, normal guys, you know, and not not uh, the <laughs> woke woke guys. So maybe they're all also going to be interested in this no masculinity because it's interest of, of the women, normal women and normal men. So yes. could you give some uh, introduction to the, to the channel that we're going to attach to our uh, to our uh, um, talk uh, in on X and YouTube? Absolutely. So I have a YouTube channel. Uh, it is called Men in the City. I also have a blog and, and very shortly I'll have a sub stack. So I'll send you all those links. Uh, what's happening in the United States in particular, and I think the West in general, less so in Poland, I'm, I'm happy to say, but there is a crisis of masculinity. And that crisis of masculinity um, it has a very clear cause. It, it's globalism. It's wokeism. It's this emasculation that has occurred since the 1960s for a variety of reasons. But at core, society has more or less turned against masculinity. And in the United States, um, institutions, uh, the government, of course, academic uh, institutions, Ivy League schools and so forth, have all zeroed in on men or what they call toxic masculinity as a threat or as a menace that undermines their effort to feminize uh, or transform Western society. And, and they're right. It, it is. It's, a, it's an impediment. It's resistance. And so men over the last 30 or 40 years have fallen through the cracks. Uh, men are disproportionately committing suicide. They're falling out of university. They are unemployed or underemployed. And what's beginning to happen is an awakening. Um, in the United States, we call it the manosphere. Uh, there's the cryptosphere. There are these various online movements that are coalescing into what I call the neo-masculine movement. And this is a movement of resistance and reform against globalism, against this feminization of our culture, of our civilization, and so forth. And I think that this force, which is largely concentrated in, in men between the ages of 20 and 40, is powerful. It's going to constitute a movement that's going to shake up the, the political world. At the same time, there is what I call the age of prosperity and the age of scarcity. The world has been in an age of prosperity more or less since the 1950s. In other words, the standard of living has been rising, benefits from the government have increased, and there's been relative social stability. Well, that order is breaking down. Um, an age of prosperity is typically characterized by the age of the feminine. So you you embrace a culture of entitlement, of openness, of tolerance, you know, all of these very feminine characteristics um, that are enabled by stability, by prosperity. But now that prosperity is beginning to dim into scarcity. So we're entering into an age of scarcity, a period in which we're going to have to reform, we're going to have to rebuild a new social order, and that will empower men to do so. So the age of scarcity will be an age of the masculine, and that is an age that we're going into, is my, uh, is my view. So um, now is a time of re-empowerment for men, and you're starting to see neo-masculine movements across the West that are becoming more powerful. Uh, new leaders are emerging, new mass movements, and you're, at the same time, you're seeing the rise of the East – a rise of masco, what I call mask masco nationalism. So strong men like Erdogan um, in Turkey, like Xi Jinping in China, like Putin in Russia. These are strong authoritarian like leaders that are beginning to emerge to resist the the globalized West as well. So we're living in very interesting times that I think are going to completely change the world and certainly change the Western world and hopefully reform it and. Uh, uh, my hope is to save the the, the Western uh, collapse, if you will, to abate that collapse and uh, restore the, the West as it once was. Okay, thank you, Cameron. Uh, I think it was quite uh, quite uh, interesting what uh, your, your remarks, uh, and hopefully we're going to have uh, another opportunity to meet uh, online, but also uh, offline uh, this year. So hopefully we're going to have uh, material for our viewers in uh, in Europe, in Poland, and the United States. So uh, uh, thanks uh, one more time that we can uh, we could meet at, at uh, on 18 of January 2024. So uh, we can we can uh, track uh, your. Uh, uh, what you said, if it's gonna, you know, um, happen in the United States and in uh, global um, affairs. 
So thanks one more time and uh, till next time. Uh, thank you for this conspiracy talk with uh, Cameron McGregor. Absolutely. Janky, janky. Okay, bye. Thanks, man. Bye-bye.